Hi, welcome back to another episode of Real World Serverless. Today, I'm joined by Zach from Steady. Hi, welcome to the show. Hi, thanks so much for having me. Um, so can you tell us a little bit about yourself and your experience with AWS and serverless? Sure. So how about I start with telling you a little bit about uh, about Steady and what exactly it is that we're building here? Sure, sounds good. So um, easiest way to think about uh, what we're building is we're sort of building this missing um, untouched piece of infrastructure, which is a network for, for global businesses. So... Um, if you think about how you might send transactions back and forth between two businesses, it's not as straightforward as you might think. Um, of course, there's the catch-all of sending uh, PDFs over email. So if you've sent a consulting invoice to someone, you've probably you know exported that from QuickBooks or Zero and uh, sent that via email. Um, but but if you're needing to do this in a high volume and send you know maybe hundreds or thousands of invoices uh, a day or a week or a month, uh, it starts to get um, pretty pretty tedious from there. So what Steady is is it's we call it a, a messaging platform for for B two B trade. So what we allow people to do is create an organization on our network, um, add users to that organization, and then exchange transactions back and forth with other organizations in 300 different message types that describe all the different ways that companies can do business with each other. Uh, might be things like invoices or ship notices, purchase orders. Uh, in the healthcare space, it could be um, you know some sort of a healthcare claim or uh, or uh, um, eligibility check, and it really just describes all the possible ways that companies can do business with each other. Um, of course, once uh, uh, in order to get these transactions onto our network, um, you know there's a number of different ways to do it. You can use our API, you can use our our UI or we are interoperable with this legacy format called X12 EDI, which is this uh, sort of file format and transfer protocol that predates XML, predates JSON, looks like it came off a dot matrix printer in 1985. So um, that's a little bit about, about what we're doing. And um, as, you've, as you've probably guessed by uh, the fact that we're, we're talking on this podcast together, um, we're using a, a 100% um, serverless approach, and, and that's something that we've done since day one. Um, so am I understanding it right that these are kind of predefined forms that are industry standard? Are these also specific to a particular country as well? Um, you know, the uh, um, there's really two competing formats in, in the world. Um, one of them is called X12 EDI, which has many, many, you know, 300 plus different transaction types. Uh, the other one is called Edifact. And Edifact is a, a more limited set, but um, is was developed by the United Nations and, and designed to help facilitate international trade. So those are the two that are that are really used. Part of the, the challenge of it, it might sound like, okay, there's this global standard, so shouldn't it be relatively easy to exchange transactions back and forth? And the, the problem is that the standard is really a superset of all possible values. So if you look at something like an X12 ship notice, uh, which is a transaction number 856, um, there might be five or six different places that you could put, let's say, a tracking number in that transaction. And so when uh, two companies get together, let's say it's Walmart and Procter and Gamble get together and they want to do business, they have to negotiate, so to speak, like a, a software contract almost that that dictates where um, uh, Procter and Gamble and Walmart are willing to to um, put this data in the transaction. Now Walmart, for example, might prefer it at this uh, at the header level of the transaction, and maybe Procter and Gamble wants to send it at the at the line level so that they can you know add detail in terms of um, what what item is in what package. And, and these sort of um, nuances is, is what causes it to to take many many weeks or months to get. Uh, one of these integrations up and running today. So what we've done is we've taken this um, superset of, of transactions. We've, um, um, I guess you could say we've forked it and then we've modernized it and, and brought our opinions to it um, that, that make it a lot less confusing when two companies want to get together and do trade. There's one place to put um, uh, each sort of piece of, of metadata around a transaction. 
Okay, I see. I think I got the gist of it that you guys are providing that consistent format so that all the different businesses can easily transact with each other. Exactly right. You might think about it similar to Stripe. So with Stripe, you don't need to work with a different Stripe API for MasterCard or Visa or Discover or American Express. Um, you have a single API that makes it easy. We, we've done that, except we've done it for 300 different transaction types and, uh, and, and made it a network such that any business can join and then, and then transact with other businesses businesses in, in our standard formats. Gotcha. Yeah. And uh, Stripe at the time was a pretty revolutionary in terms of how it manages all of that complexity uh, behind the scenes for you. So in this case, uh, how does your architecture look like from a very high level? I mean, how are you facilitating all of these transactions between different companies? Well, we started off, um, you know, we picked serverless from from the early days and, and we're up um, about three and a half years old, we're, we're a venture-backed software startup, so we've raised about twenty-one million dollars in in venture funding, and the commitment to to this serverless or you know serviceful approach came from the early days. Um, and I can talk to you a little bit about the architecture, but maybe it helped to give you a little bit of the backstory first of of how we got here. Um, you know, I came from the world of physical products before this, so I. Um, founded a, a, a brand of auto parts and manufactured a couple thousand different products in Taiwan and China um, and, and used as many um, outsourced services as I possibly could so I could just focus on, on developing these, this, these great products. And so I used an outsourced uh, manufacturing in, in Taiwan and China. I used an uh, outsourced um, uh, fulfillment, it's called, so an outsourced warehouse to stock and ship the product and so on and so forth. And um, it was an enormously, not just um, scalable way to do things, but profitable way to do things because, um, you know, it meant that every single transaction that we processed as a company, every time we got an order, um, it meant that we could fulfill that order with a very predictable cost. So we knew that it would cost us maybe, you know, $4.50 to fulfill an order and that no matter how large we scaled or how few orders we had in a day, we were going to pay this variable cost. Um, in addition to that, you know, you have this this phenomenon where hopefully the warehouse is always getting better and they're always negotiating better rates with UPS and FedEx and the post office. Um, and uh, and they're opening up multiple locations and they have insurance against uh, business interruption and all these sort of things that come from running a warehouse. And what it meant was that, um, uh, you know, as the founder of the company, I could focus exclusively on things that added value for uh, for the business. And ultimately, I, I sold that to a private equity fund um, in, uh, in in 2018. And uh, it, was, it was like uh, ended up being this remarkable business, remarkably profitable business because of the, the focus that we had just on on uh, on, on making great products and, and, and landing new customers. Uh, so if this is sounding familiar, um, it, it's probably because, uh, you know, it's a lot of the same philosophies that come to uh, the world of, of, uh, of software development and, and serverless and why so many of us are attracted to the, to the serverless model. So when I started uh, uh, steady, you know, sort of naive to the world of, of, of software development, I was, you know, doing my research and reading a, about the various cloud providers. It, it became very clear that that AWS was was far and away, um, you know, the, the the broadest offerings and the deepest offerings um, for 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 managed services, and. Um, I think naively, I just sort of assumed, well, of course, this is how software should be built. Um, you should use as many managed services as possible. You should maintain as little code as you as you possibly can, um, and and push all these things off onto uh, onto a trusted vendor. And and I guess I had the experience or the advantage of having worked with a trusted vendor for a very long time, or a number of trusted vendors. And so the the idea of lock in and and all these things didn't really worry me worry me all that much. Um, and uh, so what it looks like today, you know, we use, um, uh, we have, a, we're 100% in TypeScript, all of our infrastructure is, is written in CDK, uh, and, and I can explain how we, how we ended up getting there in some of our journeys through cloud formation and, and different languages, but um, uh, we're 100% in CDK. We use um, uh, TypeScript for the front end, um, all of our lambdas are written in TypeScript, we use API gateway, um, both v1 and v2, depending on the application. We're trying to use the v2 um, uh, HTTP APIs wherever possible, just because they're they're you know quite a, quite a few advantages. 
we use Cognito uh, for authentication, um, uh, SQS for for queues, SNS for all, you know all sort of um, uh, notifications and and uh, event driven things, along with Event Bridge um, in 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 uh, a bunch of new applications. Uh, persistence is all with Dynamo, uh, and we're doing some interesting things with multi-tenancy and Dynamo. Um, uh, of course, lambdas for for compute. We try and limit the the number of lambdas that were, or the, the amount of code that we have running in lambdas, and push these things off as much as possible. S3 for storage, um, you know, and then all the other things like STS and um, uh, uh, parameter store, KMS, and and all the the little goodies uh, in between. That's actually amazing to hear that there's someone who's new into who's new to software development, uh, don't have all the packages, uh, straight away think this is how software should be done and is natural and it makes sense. And where so many of us uh, are still, I guess we uh, we are being we're burdened by the, what we're used to, the way we're used to doing things. And uh, but yeah, this is uh, actually really amazing to hear that uh, you know you've applied the same mindset of uh, focusing on differentiations, uh, the things that you, know, that you can provide uh, and add value rather than you know, doing things that you know, someone like AWS can do a much better job of in terms of providing that infrastructure, that um, foundation to your application. Well, it's funny because there's, um, I, I think there's so much to learn um, between software development, you know, the crossover between software development and, and physical product, physical manufacturing. And um, of course, like even a lot of the terminology that people use, lean manufacturing um, uh, is, you know, lean software development, lean startup uh, is all comes out of the Toyota production system, which is, um, uh, you know, was the, the revolutionary um, system that Toyota had that allowed them to take, uh, you know, such a, a tremendous lead over the U.S. manufacturers. And there's this amazing book um, called Out of the Crisis by, by W. Edwards Deming. And uh, it was written, I think, in the 80s or the 90s uh, as sort of a, a roadmap or a wake-up call to U.S. manufacturers who were just getting demolished by, by Japanese um, uh, upstarts, if you want to call Toyota an upstart. Um, and, uh, and, and the things that they recommend um in it are you know small batch sizes um which uh which is you know the the sort of devops uh movement that we're seeing today in terms of things like uh you know the idea of if it hurts do it more often um uh, is is really similar and taken from the idea of uh from the toyota production system of of changing molds uh quickly if if, if any of this stuff is is uh, sounding familiar but in uh, out of the crisis he talks about um, the idea that one the, the biggest ways that you can um, increase efficiency is to reduce the number of suppliers that you have and increase your dependency on suppliers, um, which is really counterintuitive. I mean, you hear today, everybody's talking about, uh, oh, should we have a multi-cloud strategy and how should I build things in order to be portable? Um, and in manufacturing, that, that really used to be the idea uh, as well. But, you know, 40 years ago, um, in, in studying these Japanese manufacturers, what they found was that when um, uh, you, you use multiple suppliers, you ended up um, working to the lowest common denominator. Um, and, uh, you know, for example, if you have one person who specializes in, uh, in, in uh, uh, high strength steel and one person who specializes in, you know, uh, great finishes or something like that, um, you have to uh, reduce your your quality standards or maybe the specialization of the products that you're making in order to make use of, of, of both of these manufacturers efficiently and to use them interchangeably. And, you know, the, the uh, is maps perfectly to what you see happen when people are saying, OK, well, we're going to um, make sure that any piece of infrastructure we use can any piece of, of service that we use can be used in between um, uh, GCP and Azure and, and AWS. And of course, then you have to pick to only use uh, the feature sets that are available between all three different providers. Uh, and, and that's you're just shooting yourself in the foot. Um, you're also just increasing more points of contact and having um, more pieces of quality control that you need to do, more understanding of supplier processes um, versus, you know, committing 100% to to a certain supplier. And uh, uh, that's how manufacturing works. That's how, um, you know, it's a sort of commonly accepted practice in the manufacturing space that the, the risk of lock-in 
is a lot less than uh, you know the, the possible risk of something bad happening in the future of your vendor trying to screw you um, is uh, is a, a a lot lower than the actual costs of having to maintain the context of multiple different suppliers uh, and and the the fact that you're hamstringing yourself to not be able to use these different pieces of functionality uh, in order to sort of remain agnostic between the providers. It's funny that uh, all of these things that you talked about uh, are exactly what we're seeing happening right now in the software world, uh, especially with the whole containerization and the whole arguments around the portability and vendor locking, even though that's not the main problem that any of these companies would talk about. You know, people always talk about how they're having trouble with velocity, uh, with uh, being, being able to innovate faster, but then at the same time, they're not making technology decisions that allows them to go faster by, like you said, minimizing the number of providers and increasing your dependency on the, on the providers you have so that you can draw more value from them. It's amazing to hear that uh, you know, all of this has, been, has already happened before and that the lesson has already been learned. And I think we have a lot we can learn from, uh, from manufacturing, sounds like, uh, to you know, help us make better decisions in software. Yeah, it's it's funny. It's um, I, I guess these seem like uh, radical leaps of faith to say uh, we're gonna we're gonna 100% commit to um, to AWS. Um, but uh, um, I think uh, uh, these these are things that are commonly accepted in in other areas. I think the other piece of it is that I think a lot of um, Let's see. In in the U.S. in in manufacturing up until the 80s or the 90s, when when lean manufacturing started to take off, um, the mindset was was sort of adversarial between suppliers and and buyers. And so you assume that once you get locked into a supplier, your suppliers are gonna are gonna you know con consistently try and raise raise the prices and then do as little uh, uh, as little work as possible. And when you look at um, you know the historical relationships between um, you know software developers or software companies and companies like Oracle, um, where they are you know this this land and expand sort of strategy, um, where Oracle is trying to lock you in and then and then you know um, uh, make it difficult for you to leave and raise the prices over time, lock you into these big contracts. It's it's sort of no wonder that we've been trained in the software world to to believe that lock in is bad. If you contrast this to the to the Japanese, you know, Toyota production system sort sort of model, they view a um, uh, uh, the lines between themselves and their suppliers as as quite blurred. So when they're optimizing a factory, they're not looking just at their own factory; they're looking at all the factories of their suppliers. And to get uh, lean manufacturing, the Toyota production system fully implemented was a, a multi-decade effort. Um, by Toyota because they had to do it not just internally, but then they had to teach their suppliers um, how to do this as well. Um, and in doing so, you know uh, what what they found was was something interesting. If you look at um, the way a traditional U.S. manufacturer works when they're working on a supplier project or a project that they're going to send off to a supplier or a subcontractor to make, they will have nine people um, from uh, the the buying side and one person from the supplier side. And so they will bring in one supplier engineer or, or sales engineer to sort of help them uh, work through, you know, hey, how is this going to work on the supplier's machines? But the primary focus is on um, the, the, the internal team. In the Toyota production system way of doing things, you have nine people from the supplier, and then you have one representative um, from the from the buyer. And so the buyer will send someone who has some, you know, rough ideas and requirements, you know, exact requirements and rough ideas for implementation, and they will rely on the vendor's expertise to tell them how to build it. Um, and uh, uh, of course, what what unites the two between the buying and supplying side in in the Toyota production system or lean manufacturing method is this um, uh, common goal of eliminating waste wherever possible. Uh, and once they're united in this idea of eliminating waste, you know everybody everybody wants to reduce the waste. Everybody wants to reduce the amount of communication back and forth. Everybody wants to reduce the prices because they know that when those things happen, those costs get passed along to the customer, uh, either in terms of uh, lower prices or higher quality. And then the the relationship will continue to grow because of it. 
And so, you know, you could see a lot of uh, similarities in the way, you know, uh, someone like uh, someone like you or someone like Steady uh, works with AWS, where we are going to them and saying, tell us the best practices of how you build software in your systems. Tell us which services we should use and which integrations and which patterns we should use. And we will send some representatives on our side to sort of go in and learn with you and see how, how we can use this to, uh, to apply to our architecture. And um, so you're, you're really putting a lot of the burden on the supplier to tell you how to do things best, because the reality is this is their machinery, this is their world. Um, further, you get to this place of, uh, of, of um, because you know um, that you've chosen a supplier who is committed to eliminating waste. And that's someone like, like AWS, we really believe that they are customer driven and they're looking to constantly uh, reduce their prices. Um, and that's not just something that we believe, it's something that we've shown a long history of, of evidence with, with them proving that they are committed to reducing prices. Um, we love getting locked in because they are willing to do these things um, like come up with Lambda uh, uh, as opposed to EC, you know, when EC2 is doing great already in order to make things easier for both of us, knowing that if they can reduce our costs and increase our quality, it's going to make the relationship grow, grow overall. Um, and there's this uh, idea from, from economics called Jevons Paradox, which says that the more efficiently a resource can be produced, the more of it will be consumed. Um, so you would think that it, it sort of works the other way around, that as we get more efficient, we use less. But as you see with Lambda, uh, uh, you know, it's this very efficient way of producing compute. And for us, it means that we're going to use much, much more compute over time, and it becomes a win-win for both us and AWS. And uh, speaking of uh, best practices, uh, one of the things you've been building is this uh, multi-tenant capabilities into study. Um, can you tell us about uh, how you're approaching this? Because I know you've researched this quite a bit in terms of understanding what are the known best practices and uh, how to sort of make sure that your customers don't, uh, they're not able to access each other's data. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, we, um, we were hugely influenced by a talk at AWS reInvent 2019 called Serverless SaaS Deep Dive, building serverless SaaS on AWS. And it was ARC 410 for those of you who want to look it up. And it was a, a talk by um, Todd Golding, who is um, uh, someone from uh, uh, the AWS SaaS factory, which is AWS's internal organization, um, sort of like evangelist organization for uh, explaining how to, how to best build um, uh, serverless, serverless SaaS on, on, or not just serverless SaaS, SaaS on AWS. And this talk sort of dived into the, into the serverless aspect of it. And up till that point, you know, we had thought that we were doing things pretty, um, pretty close to, to, to the, um, you know, best practices. And when we saw that talk, it really just opened our minds to a whole new level of what it can mean to build uh, software in a, in a managed services environment. And um, Todd talks about this idea, um, uh, and I, I really encourage people to, to listen to the talk because I'm not, I'm not going to do it justice, but he starts off with this idea that, um, that the most important concept in a SaaS product is, is the concept of tenancy. Um, and, you know, picking, choosing who, who is the tenant in your system and then making sure that you're, you're making decisions in your architecture that make a multi-tenant, uh, a, a approach, a multi-tenant architecture as easy as possible. So when you look at, um, uh, what that means for, for steady, our tenant is an organization. So an organization, you know, could be, you know, the hypothetical Coca-Cola and, uh, and Walmart would each be, would each be tenants in our system. And then you also have users and, and, you know, we are in a, a little bit of a complex environment because each organization has multiple users, but a user can also be, also be a member of multiple different organizations. Um, so, you, you know, the, the example might be if there's a, um, an accountant or a, a CPA who is, uh, consulting for for two different companies, they would they would be a member of two different organizations with with one single identity. Um, and so now you you figured out this this tenancy. Um, there's a way of uh, weaving tenancy into AWS that makes the whole problem of 
um, uh, data isolation and metrics and, and, uh, and analytics much, much easier. And so the way that we do this is, is very close or, or exactly how, how Todd recommends, um, which is we have a, a, a tenant token um, so we have like a, uh, an authorization system that's based based on um, uh, Cognito or, or built off of Cognito um, with custom authorizers. And what we do is we generate this uh, this tenant token whenever whenever a user is assuming the context of an organization. And that tenant token is included on every single uh, call that we make. So it's uh, it's used for for all the services that we that we uh, uh, might call on the back end. And when you start doing this, I'll, I'll use an example of of uh, how it works in DynamoDB. Um, uh, things start to get uh, uh, pretty cool. So we use a pooled uh, database. We're not using a, a separate table per customer. We have, you know, for for a given service, you're you're um, uh, uh, putting, you know, for example, all the transactions into a into a single table. And what you do is you use the tenant ID um, as, uh, which is the organization's ID, as the partition key in Dynamo. And um, you can set up the the uh, you know I am roles such that uh, the, a user only has access or or a, a caller only has access to data where the um, where the uh, uh, tenant ID equals the the partition key. And so I'm glossing over some of the details here, but it's basically you know role ba uh, row based access. Um, and what that means from a data standpoint is it's very, very difficult to get access, to accidentally get access or give access to somebody else's uh, data because it's all in the partition key. And uh, also, it simplifies uh, the code that you're, that you're writing. So instead of a developer who's working on, um, you know, some sort of a, a call to Dynamo saying, okay, I need to think about what the what the tenancy context here is and make sure that I'm, you know, writing these, uh, you know, select statements or or whatever in a very careful way to make sure that that we're getting the right data. Um, the the uh, uh, code can be written such that it just says, give me all the data in Dynamo. Uh, matching this query, as opposed to give me all the data that belongs to me. So you're just saying, give me all the data that's that's in Dynamo, and then Dynamo, or you know, AWS and I am, and, and Dynamo are doing the hard work of figuring out what you're supposed to have access and handing that back to you. Um, so so that's the the first cool thing that happens when you're when you're working in this concept of of uh, with, with these this tenant ID or tenant token. The second is something that really excites me coming from the business side of things, um, which is which are the accounting implications. Um, the accounting implications of uh, serverless, I think, is you know one of the most exciting things to me about the the world of serverless. If um, if you're familiar with the business side of the house, you know if if you're looking at um, your your financial results from the the previous period, let's say the previous quarter or the previous month, um, you have your revenue, which is the amount of of money that you build your customers, but you also need to know what your cost of goods sold is, and the cost of goods sold is basically all the things that go into delivering the product to the customer. Um, and so in a business like ours, it's it's really the cost of processing that transaction. So um, if we get a, a transaction for our, uh, from a customer, uh, uh, on behalf of a customer, we charge you know uh, 10 cents for the first transaction or for the first 50,000 transactions in a month, and then one cent per transaction for the next 950,000. Let's say we build the customer 10 cents. Now, um, the cost of fulfilling that transaction are all those API calls and the and the Dynamo calls and and the Cognito fees and all these things that are related to that, and it rolls up to some fraction of a cent. Now, um, you're you're probably familiar, you know, intimately familiar with the AWS cost and usage report, uh, and so you could take that uh, CSV and you can roll that up and you can um, bring that into your accounting system, and you could say we spec spent uh, you know uh, one thousand dollars last month on AWS fees, and we spent ten thousand dollars last month on, uh, or we we received ten thousand dollars a month from our customers, we build our customers ten thousand dollars a month, um, and so you could say that your cost of goods sold. Is, uh, is about 
But what you can't do is you can't say, tell me what my profitability is on a customer by customer basis. Um, uh, this this is uh, particularly hard if you're in like an EC2 or uh, or a Kubernetes world um, or a container world where you're trying to you know allocate the costs on a per per tenant basis. There's it's really all lumped together in these in these like always on instances, and you, you can't really figure out what the costs are. Um, what uh, serverless does is that first of all, it means that you're only spending money with AWS in a, in a properly designed system. You're only spending money with AWS every time you're, you're, you're invoking a transaction uh, on behalf of your customer. But the second thing that you could do is you can um, tie the tenant ID or the tenant token into all of your cloud, tra uh, cloud trail or cloud watch logs, along with some basic metrics around these invocations. So you can have your Lambda um, emit uh, in the log data saying, uh, hey, I'm a Lambda function, I'm this size, I ran for this many seconds and processed this amount of data. And uh, I did it on behalf of this tenant. And we can then take those uh, uh, those CloudWatch logs and we can roll those up to some sort of an aggregation service and take those uh, metrics and we can multiply them times the uh, AWS pricing API and we can figure out um, what the exact uh, uh, cost is on a tenant by tenant or even transaction by transaction basis. And that might sound like a whole lot of, you know, bean counting, but the idea here is that if we can get a very granular view into what a transaction costs us for a given customer, uh, we can price lower than anybody else uh, in the world. And uh, and that's a that's a tremendous advantage. So that's those are I would say the two main points: uh, the ability to to just dramatically simplify the code that you're writing by uh, letting AWS do the heavy lifting in terms of you know um, uh, IAM access uh, for 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 data and data partitioning, and the second is the accounting implications of it. So on the accounting side of things, uh, are you familiar with uh, Simon Wadley? Um, I've I've followed him on Twitter, but I haven't seen his discussions around accounting at all. So Simon has often talked about this idea of uh, FinDev or um, whereby finance and development can kind of work together. And the one of that, one sort of aspect of that is the fact that with uh, serverless, you have a paper use. So as you said, you can work out the cost for individual components as well as the cost for individual customers or tenants in your system. And in this case, uh, you can do some micro optimizations by identifying which component the, uh, you should focus on optimizing because maybe 99% of your architecture is just not worth optimizing and uh, uh, in the previous episode I think it was episode 17 when I spoke with Alexander and the Slobo then we also talked about this idea of FinDev and how we can actually use it to help us prioritize work and work out you know, which of the you know, which bit of work is worth uh, fixing because maybe it's a bug but if you look at how much impact it's having maybe it's also it's only costing you ten dollars a month uh, as, as, as a problem but to, to actually fix it, you may have to spend days of engineering time, which can easily you know, amount to hundreds, maybe even thousands of dollars. So you can then start to also take into account the, the, the cost impact of different issues and decide and help you prioritize uh, what issues you should be working on uh, first and foremost uh, as well. And the Simon Wilder has been one of those, I guess, the pioneers in this area of uh, looking at serverless um, not only as a, de a development uh, methodology but also in, in how it enables businesses to, to work differently and how it enables finance departments and accounting departments to collaborate with development teams yeah i i love that the the term findev uh every time i hear it i, I remember how how much i like it um i think um you know it's funny uh, a, a lot of people, their their eyes gloss over when you when you talk about finance or accounting. Um, and and uh, similar to people outside the world of technology, when you start talking about uh, engineering concepts, their eyes glaze over. And that phenomenon happens because people believe that it's just too complicated for them to understand. That it's this like dark art that you have to you know go through this uh, uh, special learning process in order to understand. Uh, but but the reality is that. You know, 10 years ago, I didn't know anything about finance and accounting hardly, and and four years ago, I knew hardly anything about about uh, software engineering and and uh, and software development. Um, but but these things are very learnable, and so I would I would say for for um, engineers who are interested in this idea of 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 FinDev. Um, Finance and accounting is is an overloaded. You know, it's 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 too big of a concept. It's really that all 
Um, uh, the way we look at things is, first of all, we believe this idea of, of how you do one thing is how you do everything. And that I think that one problem that a lot of, of companies in technology uh, have is that they treat engineering problems as first class problems and then finance problems and, you know, all these other sort of back office things as, uh, as second class problems, problems that aren't as important. Um, and so, uh, if you've if you've read that Google SRE book, um, uh, they talk about this idea uh, that that SRE is what happens when you take uh, the concept of software engineering and the principles from software engineering and you apply it to operations. Um, we believe that that's possible to apply to all sorts of of uh, of business operations. Um, and the important thing in getting this done is to marry. Uh, uh, the the world of engineering and the world of finance um, uh, very early. And um, to get back to what I was saying before, the idea is that it's not, you don't need to think about, you know, all these uh, fancy things like the income statement or the balance sheet or the cash flow statement or or, uh, or or market caps or any of these these finance and accounting terms. What it really comes down to is good bookkeeping. So um, the good bookkeeping, which is how you allocate your costs and uh, your expenses and your, and your revenue, uh, everything else is built on top of that. So um, the reason why I bring up this idea of, of weaving the tenant ID into your into your log so that you can figure out uh, exactly what 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 your you know where you're spending money in in AWS is that that's the most granular business look into um, uh, your 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 uh, engineering um, uh, practices or, or, or engineering system that you could possibly have. Um, and so a lot of times what you see companies doing is they sort of uh, have all this stuff going on in, in the AWS engineering land, and then they'll package these logs up and they'll ship them off to some, you know, BI system. And then from there, you know, some financial analysts uh, look at it and try and make sense of it. We think that the wrong way to go about it is to take engineering data and bring it into world of finance. We think the right way to do it is to embed these finance people into the engineering teams and make sure that that the the that the accounting bookkeeping data is being sort of uh, 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 brought in and accounted for um, uh, as close to the metal as possible, so to speak. Um, so I know these are, you know, I'm, I'm talking in, in, in vague sort of terms here, um, but the basic idea is that if you look at that AWS cost and usage report, you know, it's hundreds and hundreds of thousands of lines long, and it might look like the most detailed great thing in the world, uh, but the reality is that it doesn't give you any business information there. It doesn't tell you anything about um, uh, how those costs um, um, roll up to customers. And if we're talking about AWS wish list items, um, you can tag a resource such that that tag shows up in in the uh, cost and billing report. So you can say, hey, this Lambda, I'm gonna give it you know, tag foo. And then in the usage report, I can roll things up by tag foo. But that doesn't tell you on a, that tells you a static tag for a Lambda. It doesn't tell you the dynamic tag that's being applied. You can't you know, dynamically apply a tag uh, for each tenant for call or something like that, uh, and, and then have that show up on the usage report. So we would love to see that. Um, but but we think that it's you know uh, probably somewhat unlikely that they do that anytime in the near future. Yeah, that's probably a bit uh, difficult for them to implement uh, being able to tag individual invocations as well as execution for all of their services. Really, not just Lambda, but also DynamoDB, API Gateway, and so on. Um, I've implemented similar cost allocation engines uh, like you have done here as well uh, for other customers where. Basically, we have done the same thing. Uh, we just use logs that uh, we just write every time we need to access something from DynamoDB or S3, and uh, we embed the tenant ID uh, into that log message so that we can then process them after the fact to you know create aggregate reports uh, for uh, every I don't know every day, every month uh, on how much uh, cost we have incurred on uh, on for ser on serving this particular customer. Um, are there anything else that you would like to sort of add to your AWS uh, wish list? You know, it's funny with some of these things like the so many things on the AWS wish list that we have just get done. Like they just they just seem to show up on a on a regular basis. Um, with with things like this um, uh, tenant based costing or tag based costing, dynamic tag tag based costing, we're at, we're actually, we're really happy that AWS hasn't implemented this. Um, it's a it's a tough 
it's a really tough thing to build and, and to do right. Um, but we like having this as an advantage over other competitors um, because we like the fact that we can understand our usage and cost patterns and our customer profitability uh, better than anybody else. And so, you know, I actually think that it's one of the main advantages that AWS has over other cloud providers. So knowing people inside GCP and knowing people inside AWS, uh, knowing people inside Azure, um, AWS is way better at their internal cost accounting. Um, and so, you know, at the meta level, doing this sort of stuff on their side so that uh, so that they can understand their profitability by customer. Um, they are, are light years ahead of, of someone like uh, a GCP or an Azure in terms of how they do it. And I suspect it's actually because AWS, the, the founding story of AWS is, is really... Um, uh, comes from the world of physical products, where as a retailer, um, AW, uh, you know, Amazon as a retailer probably took it for granted that they should understand what their cost of goods sold are on a granular, you know, customer by customer or product by product basis. Uh, and so when they started AWS, they probably brought some of those assumptions in, maybe naively, and and just did a very good job of cost accounting from the early days. Uh, and I think when you look at someone like a GCP or an Azure, they didn't you know, uh, GCP and, and Azure, or Google and Microsoft both print money. Um, AWS is a, Amazon is a low margin business, uh, whereas of course AWS is not, but Amazon is a low margin business, whereas whereas Microsoft and G, and uh, Google are, are not. And so um, I imagine they just came with a different level of, of cost discipline. Um, so, so those are those are a couple of the, the you know just just higher level thoughts on on when we're glad that AWS doesn't build something, uh, and, and this is one of those rare cases. But in terms of other things that we want, um, you know, we would love to see a, a 100% serverless Elasticsearch. Um, you know, pay, paper use Elasticsearch is is a big one. Elasticsearch is the only piece of our infrastructure that we have that is not um, uh, paper use billing, and and uh, and that's painful. Um, the other one is uh, IAM authorization on the HTTP APIs. Uh, I think we need, or, or we've talked about needing in the past. Um, I don't think the HTTP APIs have um, uh, throttling uh, uh, built in yet, like API keys with, with throttle, throttle keys and stuff like that. Um, those, those are a couple of the other things that come to mind. Yeah, that's funny. I think you're the fourth person on this podcast uh, to ask for serverless Elasticsearch. Uh, it's one of the few things that, that everyone still have to run Elasticsearch uh, while paying for EC2 uptime uh, for pretty much everyone. And I think for the HTTP API side of things, uh, IAM with authentication and the throttling, those should be coming. Uh, well, AWS wouldn't commit to any you know, timeline, <laughs> uh, but those are definitely coming because I know one of their priorities uh, for API Gateway HTTP API this year is to try to get to feature parity with uh, REST API. So, you know, fingers crossed, um, those won't be too far off. Um, okay, and I think that's sort of the end of the questions that I've got. Is there anything else that you'd like to share with the listeners, uh, maybe personal projects or things that you are doing at the uh, Steady? You know, I, I think the biggest thing is that um, we just continue to realize that you can push this this stuff so much further than you think. And an example of that, you know, I think we have four or five uh, former AWS folks on our on our engineering team, and so we think we have a pretty good grasp of AWS. And then you go off and you watch that talk by Todd Golding and realize, you know, how far people are 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 pushing things out there. Um, and, you know, some of our projects um, internally for, you know, these, these more business or accounting finance focused um, uh, projects for getting very granular cost accounting from, from the early days, I think, um, uh, are, are things that we're very excited about. But the bigger piece maybe that I would say is that we've arrived at this idea of managed services and serverless as a, as a subset of our Poor philosophy, um, which is you know we build for scale, um, we we build on uh, using tools that are continuously improving over time. Um, so that's not just on the engineering side, that's on the product side, that's on the billing side, that's on the you know HR side. We use best of breed tools wherever we can, and so we don't view like serverless and managed services as this radical um, radical thing. It's just a, another piece of the puzzle that we have, you know, another piece of puzzle that we have internally. It's just basically how we run 
the engineering side of things. We look at um, uh, all these concepts under uh, an umbrella um, principle that we call zero touch operations. And um, what that means is that like we're just pushing to get uh, to have no buttons to press, uh, no operational you know toil. Um, but that's not just internally; that's also externally for our customers. So we are building a 100% self-service platform so that customers never have to open a support case to get some new feature, or piece of functionality, or or add more users, or form trading partner connections, or update their credit card, or any of these things. Um, you know that's that's might sound like table stakes to, to the world of engineering, but in the world of business tools, um, you know, that's, that's, it's still pretty revolutionary. Um, so we don't expect our uh, customers to press buttons. We don't expect our customers to deal with inefficiencies and, and we don't expect to, to deal with it internally. And so I think like, um, you know, selfishly, I would just say that to me, it's a bad sign if using managed services inside of a company um, is is contentious because it's not really a an engineering a problem with the engineering principle. It's a broader problem with how the company is run overall, or or maybe not the company. That's too strong of a statement. How the comp what the company's principles are or or goals are overall. When you look at these sorts of decisions, you know we we look at it like we're trying to to gain the maximum amount of leverage and have people work on things that they uh, that they that they really enjoy working on. And I think uh, the problem maybe with all of this is that when you make the decision to build on these managed services and live in AWS's world, it really does require a total commitment. And if you go 80% of the way there, and then you know you you just don't have this relentless curiosity to understanding the best practices and stay on top of this stuff, I think the results are are worse than running uh, you know a, a, a Rails monolith in a you know Docker container on ECS or something. I, I think like it, it just requires that level of commitment, and and I think that that's been the biggest challenge for us is getting. Uh, finding the people who who are philosophically aligned, but now we're we're 26 people who are who are all philosophically aligned there. So I know I didn't quite answer your question, um, but uh, my my personal project I would say is building an organization that has this sort of mindset where people just want to get together um, and and build something that's at the very forefront of what's possible. We very much believe that that it's achievable for us to process every B2B transaction on the planet um, with a total team uh, of 150 people. And I don't mean a total engineering team of 150 people. I mean a total team uh, across all the functions. So that's what's that's what's that's uh, what's top of mind for me. Amazing, and uh, for and uh, I certainly hope you guys succeed uh, uh, in dominating that uh, particular space. And I hope more people hear your words um, that uh, you know see this partnership with AWS or whoever cl your pro uh, cloud provider is as a win-win and don't see it as an adversary relationship. Where it's you know it's not zero-sum game. We, everyone can work together and uh, and for everyone's uh, um, betterment. Yeah, I, I couldn't couldn't agree more. Again, Zach, uh, thank you so much for joining us uh, on this uh, podcast and uh, sharing your stories. I love the experience that you shared from manufacturing. I had no idea that there's so much commonalities between our fields. Yeah, and I'm a huge fan of the podcast and and huge fan of all your writing. We, we not a not a, a week goes by that one of your blog posts doesn't doesn't circulate internally. So thanks for all the all the work you do. <laughs> Excellent. Glad that I could help. Uh, and again, thank you very much and uh, take care. Take care. Thanks. Bye-bye. That's it for another episode of Real World Serverless. To access the show notes and the transcript, please go to realworldserverless.com. And I'll see you guys next time.